So today we're going to be talking about genetic counseling and testing, who might benefit, how they might benefit from genetic counseling, and just a little bit more about genetics and uh, just a little bit of teaching there. So, okay, next slide. <clears throat> so we're going to review the difference between hereditary cancer and sporadic cancer, who might benefit from referral, what's the difference between genetic testing of tumor and blood, um, why consider having a genetics evaluation, what's involved, and um, how does the diagnosis of hereditary cancer help with medical management, cancer prevention, and medical management for family members. So um, I was thinking perhaps we could lecture and then end with a little bit of time for questions if people wanna ask questions at the end. So perhaps we'll try to leave like five, 10 minutes at the end or something like that, if you think that that would be good. Okay. All right, so, um, so as you can see from this chart, only a small proportion of cancer is actually what we call hereditary. It's about 10%. These are cancers that where we see a strong pattern of hereditary cancer in a family, and we can um, often find a gene mutation that might have predisposed family members to develop cancer. Um, there's also an additional proportion, and this represents a lot more, where cancer may just seem to run in the family. And we don't really know why that is. We don't necessarily find a gene mutation. We might see a pattern. Sometimes we see families with multiple cases of cancer, but we do genetic testing on the person with cancer and we find nothing on the genetic test results. So we don't really know if, it's a, if there's a genetic factor that we're testing for, or perhaps um, a shared environment or shared experience within a family that may be contributing to why some families have more cases of cancer. And the majority of cancer is sporadic, meaning it just happens and one person is affected or, um, and it just seems to happen either more for environmental reasons or out of the blue. Um, so, okay, you can, yeah. So sporadic cancer tends to have later age of onset um, and, and then um, there might maybe fewer cancers in the family. Um, and then there's not a clear pattern of cancer in the family. And this is an example of a sporadic cancer family. And I'm showing a pedigree where females are circles and males are squares. And if, um, and so you can see here, the grandmother um, had breast cancer at age 88. And then her granddaughter who has the arrow pointing to her is asking, you know, is do I have to worry about hereditary breast cancer? And we'd say, no, because your grandma was older when she got it and there's no other cases in the family. We would call this sporadic um, and there's no need for her to have genetic testing done. Um, now, hereditary cancer is caused by a mutated gene that's been passed down from a parent. Um, and so this can be passed down such that a parent has a 50% ch chance of passing it on. Um, that's a, in genetics, we call that dominant or autosomal dominant. Um, and then individuals who carry the genetic change have an increased risk for developing cancer. And this tends to occur in younger individuals. And so we get a little more concerned about hereditary cancer if somebody has cancer under age 50 for certain types of cancer. And I'm gonna explain that in just a bit. Um, this is a family where you can see there's many cases of breast cancer, and this is a four generation family where you can see that um, there's breast cancer in every generation. Um, maybe Jacob, you can just highlight the, the people in the top generation, the great grandmother for, at age 45, grandmother at 44, um, and then the, um, the mother at 50 and then grand, great granddaughter at 30. So you can see really young ages of onset. And then there's also ovarian cancer and prostate cancer in this family. And some genes can cause both breast and ovarian um, as well as prostate. So you can see they can, they're, the same genetic factor can be related to some different types of cancer. Um, and so here are some of the things that we're looking for when we think about hereditary cancer. Um, some of the, the, the top bullet has some of the cancers that automatically, if someone's diagnosed under age 50, then we would like to see them in genetics for genetic testing. So breast, uterine, colon, stomach, brain, 
any other GI cancer diagnosed under 50. Um, and then there's certain diagnoses that any um, age diagnosed individual, um, we'd like to see, we would recommend genetic testing, ovarian, pancreatic cancer, or male breast cancer. Prostate cancer, it can also depend on the Gleason score or how, which is how aggressive the prostate cancer is, because if it is more aggressive, it is more likely to be hereditary. Um, sarcoma is um, a tumor, again, under age 50. And then there's some rare tumors like ocular melanoma, adrenal cortical carcinoma that have a very high, very high likelihood of being hereditary. Um, and then melanoma with family history of melanoma or other cancers listed above. So melanoma can sometimes run in families with other cancers if it can be related to a hereditary cause. Um, and then these are some cancers that are typically not associated with a hereditary cause. So, and I know that through the AYA program, there are a lot of individuals who have some of these types of cancers, such as cervical cancer, lung, testicular, leukemia, lymphoma, and thyroid. These ones are less likely to be associated with hereditary cause unless, and that's a big unless, there's a family history of cancer. And then um, there can be some relationships in families um, between certain genes and some of those types of cancer, although it is more rare. So we, so usually family history is the flag in those families or um, tumor genetics shows possible hereditary mutation. And I'm gonna explain that, what the tumor genetics is in just a little bit. So um, I'm first gonna, so I'm gonna talk about um, hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndrome caused by mutations in the BRCA1 or BRCA2 gene. Um, these, this syndrome um, can cause an increased risk for women to develop breast cancer and ovarian cancer, and also increases the risk for pancreatic, prostate, and male breast cancer. Um, the lifetime risks are fairly high. So if somebody is born with a hereditary mutation, one of these genes, um, the risk of breast cancer is for women is between 50 and 85%. It's a high risk for a second breast cancer. And there's also an increased risk of ovarian cancer, which is higher in BRCA1 than BRCA2. And then in men, there's also an association with male breast cancer and prostate cancer. And as I said, pancreatic cancer and um, even melanoma risks are um, increased most notably in BRCA2. So um, the recommendations for breast screening really vary if somebody has a, a mutation identified. So um, for patient age 25 and up, if someone has a mutation, they're recommended to have an annual mammogram and an annual breast MRI. Um, actually, the um, annual mammogram actually starts at 30, but essentially they're screened from age 25 and up. But if a patient is in the general population, um, they would just be advised to have a mammogram starting at age 45. So that's a really big difference. The breast screening is quite different if someone carries a mutation. With ovarian cancer, um, there, unfortunately, the screening tests do not work. So there's ultrasounds and blood tests that are unreliable for detecting early, early ovarian cancer. So unfortunately, the recommendation is to surgically remove the ovaries and fallopian tubes after childbearing is complete, ideally age 35 to 40 um, in BRCA1, but it's, it can be later in BRCA2. And also we recommend oral contraceptives, which can help to reduce ovarian cancer risk. Men with BRCA mutations are recommended to undergo prostate screening starting at age 40, as well as breast screening um, with clinical exam and self-awareness and occasionally mammograms can also be helpful in men. So this is an example of a case that I saw. Um, this was a 33 year old woman, um, perhaps Jacob, you could put your mouse on the, on the patient. Um, she was diagnosed with breast cancer. She, she actually detected her own mass and then the follow-up confirmed breast cancer. Um, she was actually having some discharge from the right breast um, and she was fully worked up and it turned out she had very extensive disease on the right breast. Um, <clears throat> so she actually was counseled 
Um, she had genetic counseling. Um, this was actually during COVID. I met with her remotely by Zoom. We do some of our sessions by Zoom. And um, I was able to get genetic testing done for her. And it found that she actually carries a BRCA2 mutation. So she found this out actually before she went through her breast surgery. And fortunately, they were able to um, counsel her about the high risk of breast cancer developing on the other breast. And this was really quite a surprise because if you look at her family history, she has um, on the mother's side, she has a lot of females. There's her mother and seven aunts. Um, and there is no history of breast cancer. There is prostate cancer uh, and advanced prostate cancer in her maternal grandfather. Um, and then on the father's side, there's a, there's a lot of actually missing information because of unfortunate events in the family. Um, so there's actually much less info on the father's side. Um, and then the paternal grandmother had uterine cancer at age 50. Uterine cancer is not associated with BRCA2. So, and she lived to 65 and died of other causes. So I don't think that would be related. Um, so this, um, if you just go back um, for the patient, um, she did not need chemo, fortunately, because it was, even though she had extensive disease, the disease wasn't malignant throughout the whole breast. So she was able to um, avoid chemo, but she did have to take tamoxifen for two years um, before considering having another child. And she's actually just finished that two years of tamoxifen. Um, and she's um, been meeting with a gynecology specialist about her ovaries. And it's been recommended that she has her ovaries removed between age 40 to 45. Um, and that will give her enough time to um, complete her um, fertility. Um, and then her family members, have, I've also seen them for genetic counseling because there's a lot, as I said, that can be done for screening if someone tests positive. So her sister, her younger sister is 25. She tested negative for the uh, BRCA2. So each of the siblings actually did have 50-50 chance, but she got lucky and tested negative. And then the 42-year-old brother, um, he wanted to be tested because of the risk of prostate cancer and also because he has a daughter. And fortunately, his results came up negative as well. And I haven't met with the parents yet. I think I've, it's been something that they wanted to do, but has not happened yet. So we still don't know um, what side of the family this came from, but it's, um, I'm kind of guessing dad's side, but we'll see. Okay, next slide. Um, all right, so another thing I wanted to mention is sometimes the genetic mutations can actually um, be helpful for treatment of cancer. So for example, um, in BRCA mutated breast cancer and ovarian cancer, prostate and pancreatic cancer, um, there is something called a PARP inhibitor, which is a type of chemo, which can be given to block an enzyme in the body that normally repairs damaged DNA. And so by blocking um, this PARP, it is toxic to cancer cells that are defective in BRCA1 or 2, resulting in the death of the cancer cell. So um, this is a really useful tool that's actually been proven um, in many cancers to be effective in preventing recurrence. So sometimes these genetically driven cancers can actually have a targeted treatment. And so um, sometimes then genetic testing is done also to lead to treatment alternatives. Um, so uh, yeah, so it's, that's been one of the newer developments over the last few years. It's made the importance of genetic testing um, really come to the forefront. So I wanted just to take a moment to explain a little bit more about different ways of studying genetics in cancer patients. So, and sometimes, um, the terms can be confusing and also the, even doctors kind of mix up the two types of testing. So it's sometimes a little bit hard to understand. So I thought I'd just take a moment to explain it. So <clears throat> what I've been talking about on, um, in this lecture so far is genetic testing of blood. Um, and that could be actually blood or saliva. And that's on the right-hand side. Um, a blood test can be done <clears throat> to detect the genes that are inherited. And so when we're talking about hereditary cancer, that's really what we're talking about. 
And so the results can help family members and then the patient can learn more about future cancer risks and adjust their screenings. And so like in the case that I was telling you about, about the breast cancer patient, the results were really important because it helped her to avoid, you know, another breast cancer by having a bilateral mastectomy. She's also going to be avoiding ovarian cancer ultimately by having her ovaries removed. Um, and then family members are also learning about their risk. The other type of testing is genetic testing of a tumor. Genetic testing of the tumor can be done from a biopsy or from a surgical specimen. And those results are done to help the oncologist choose treatments. And so again, as I said, um, targeting therapies based on the genetics. Now, in this case, I'm talking about the genetics of the tumor because tumors actually have their own genetics because as uh, cancer grows, the tumors develop more and more mutations. And so those mutations can sometimes um, be targeted and even make someone eligible for a clinical trial. Um, so this came to the forefront in the next case I'm about to present. This was a 33 year old with cervical cancer. And looking her family history is somewhat significant um, for cancer on the maternal side. Mom didn't have cancer, but there's an aunt who had breast cancer and maternal grandfather um, who had an unknown cancer died of other causes. Um, so, and he was older, 91. So when this patient, this patient um, wouldn't have been referred for genetic testing because she had cervical cancer, which as I said, is not one of the types of cancer that tends to be related to um, heredity. So next slide. Um, she had a genetic test of the tumor material from a liver biopsy, because unfortunately this was a very advanced cervical cancer that had spread to her liver. And one of the alterations that genetic changes found is the BRCA2, um, the, it, where in the, yeah, right there, it says um, there's actually a specific genetic change in BRCA2. So our oncologist identified that in her tumor and referred her to me for genetic counseling to further evaluate this um, mutation because everything we're born with, every mutation that we have is actually in every cell of our body, including tumors. So if it was in the tumor, the question is, was that just a result of the tumor mutating or was that something she was born with that actually is in every cell of the body? So um, we did genetic testing for this patient. Next slide. And so I met with her. Um, I counseled her about what BRCA2 is related to um, and the impact for her surgical decision because she was actually um, going to be undergoing surgery for her cervical cancer. And the question came up as to um, her ovaries. She's very young, but um, she had already gone through a lot of radiation and was deemed to be um, on her. She would have lost her ovarian function from the radiation. So the question is whether to take out her ovaries. And the blood test did confirm that the BRCA2 mutation was in fact hereditary. Um, and, um, but it was not the explanation for her cervical cancer. So the BRCA2, um, is something that could increase her risk for breast cancer and ovarian cancer, but is not related to cervical cancer. Um, it did impact her immediate surgical decision-making. Um, and then counseling was also provided about future breast cancer risk and counseling was also offered for family members. So, um, yeah, so now I'm gonna, um, so now I'm gonna pass this over to Jacob. He's gonna tell you more about some other types of hereditary cancer. Yeah, thanks, Julie. So um, Julie covered hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndrome, which is an indication that we see quite often um, and get referrals for, for patients even within the AYA population. Another common um, hereditary cancer syndrome that we see um, and get many referrals for is something that's called Lynch syndrome. So. Or uh, as promised, um, I'll discuss Lynch syndrome. I know you had mentioned it at the beginning, um, but this is a condition that is caused by uh, a mutation in one of five different genes. And those genes are listed here. So they're all seemingly random acronyms, but um, the genes that we tend to test for with hereditary cancer are ones that are actually important for defending our bodies from cancer and fixing, oftentimes fixing errors within the DNA to prevent cancer from occurring. Um, now, if someone is born with a mutation in one of these genes, then they have Lynch syndrome and are at a significantly increased risk for developing colon cancer, endometrial cancer, ovarian cancer, and also some uh, other cancers, as you can see here. So 
um, there's and it's it's sort of gene specific, but the the cancer risks and types sort of vary depending on what gene it is. Um, but when we meet with families uh, concerned uh, that are concerning for Lynch syndrome, the main cancers that we tend to focus on are primarily for colon cancer and uh, endometrial cancer, as we'll sort of discuss here. So, if we see a family um, that is this is a family that might warrant assessment for Lynch syndrome, and what you tend to see as you might with um, some of the other cases that Julia's presented um, is earlier onset cancers. You tend to see cancers in multiple generations. And then the type of cancer matters here. So if we're seeing colon cancers and colorectal cancers or rectal cancers, as well as uterine cancers, then our index of suspicion is, um, is you know, we start to suspect Lynch syndrome more as, as um, the top of the differential diagnosis. And I think, you know, the main reason that we're assessing for Lynch syndrome and with all the patients I meet with, I basically outline the fact that there's um, three main goals that can be uh, attained by doing genetic testing. And one of them is understanding what the risk is so that we can implement early screening and detection and in some cases prevention. Um, so as you can see here, those with Lynch syndrome are offered earlier and more frequent colonoscopies as well as upper endoscopies to screen for upper gastrointestinal cancers. And also uh, for some of these female cancer risks where like Julia's mentioned, ovarian cancer risk screening is relatively poor. Um, we, some women will actually consider preventative surgery, having their ovaries removed and, um, and, and also having their uterus removed as we will also discuss. Um, the third benefit that we'll talk about more later actually has to do with something that Julie's already touched upon as well, which is that we're learning more about how uh, mutations in the germline, meaning um, mutations that someone's born with, um, might impact treatment or just how genetic testing in general can impact um, someone's treatment course. The first thing I'll focus on is sort of the um, rationale for frequent colonoscopy in Lynch syndrome patients. And there's there's been studies that have shown that um, there's a natural process by which a col colon polyp will form and then eventually progress into a cancer. So that's what an adenoma is. It's just um, a precancerous polyp um, that can turn into cancer. And in the general population, when a polyp forms, it might take it five to 10 years to actually develop into an actual cancer. But in those with Lynch syndrome, that's an accelerated process. And we tend to see that uh, a polyp can actually turn into cancer within one to three years. And that's the main uh, rationale for more frequent colonoscopies. And also these polyps um, and colon cancer can happen at younger ages, which, which is why we recommend um, earlier screening. Now, uh, as promised, I'll sort of touch upon um, the fact that uh, recently genetic testing for uh, the genes we're born with, but also tumor testing has uh, led to advancements in, in treating individuals who have Lynch syndrome related cancers. And as I mentioned, the um, what we're really focusing on here is whether or not someone's born with uh, a mutation in one of their genes. And this is uh, the DNA molecule that I'm sure you've all seen before, but for people with Lynch syndrome, the ones that are helping to fix these errors within the DNA are not functioning properly and, and they sort of have a head start on developing cancer. Um, now, this can ultimately lead to cancers forming in the colon. Um, and uh, these, as we've learned, are actually have certain characteristics to them that I won't go too much into the weeds about. But when we start to look at the uh, certain characteristics of the tumor, it gives us gives us clues that the cancer actually might be at higher risk for being hereditary or caused by a mutation that someone was born in, such as a uh, mutation that causes Lynch syndrome. And something that we look for is called um, MSI high, and we know that a relatively higher proportion of these are caught, uh, are hereditary. So recent advancements have shown that immunotherapy, so this is a, a, a immunotherapy molecule, have shown um, been shown to be more effective for people with Lynch syndrome, and they're actually responding better to these types of treatments. So um, there's you know, a lot of promising uh, developments in that space as well. Now, um, I also wanted to present a case um, and actually a couple cases about hereditary col colorectal cancer syndromes that exemplify why it's important for patients, but also their families, including the AYA population to undergo genetic testing if there's a known familial variant or syndrome in the family and uh, if there's a concerning family history. Uh, I met with this gentleman relatively recently um, who presented with anemia and blood in his stool and got a colonoscopy, which showed uh, a, a mass in the anal rectal verge. And it was biopsied and showed rectal cancer. 
Right after that, he was unfortunately diagnosed with another um, gastrointestinal cancer. And when you start to look at the family history, it's what we sometimes call truncated, where we don't have a whole lot of relatives to assess, um, you know, not many aunts and uncles on this side. He doesn't have many siblings, not many aunts or uncles on this side. And some people are passing away at younger ages. And we might have sort of an incomplete family history where we don't know what type of cancers might have affected family members. So um, we, as um, Julie's mentioning, it's more routine nowadays to do tumor testing. And that can sometimes give us, give us clues as to whether or not someone might have a hereditary cancer syndrome based on what's found. Um, there are certain um, markers that begin to tell us whether or not we might be more, um, I guess, suspicious of Lynch syndrome. And so for this individual, a couple of his Lynch syndrome um, proteins were not present when they analyzed the tumor. And that can really start to raise the concern that this pathway for fixing the DNA is down in the tumor and there might be Lynch syndrome that's worth assessing for. Um, and that causes this other condition I just showed you called MSI high. So, uh, and this diagram just explains that we're starting to become more concerned about hereditary colorectal cancer in this case. Additionally, we look for certain uh, mutations in the, in the tumor itself. And as Julie has also mentioned, there are many mutations that are in cancer and in the tumor. And it's because cancer is a genetic disease. Um, you know, uh, mutations that we acquire can cause these cancers and the cancer evolves and more mutations tend to pile up. And so uh, part of our jobs are, are to really sift through these and determine which of these are more concerning for um, things that might be hereditary. And one of the ones that was shown on his um, tumor testing was uh, a, a mutation in one of the Lynch syndrome genes, MSH2. So um, genetic testing with a blood sample was offered and indeed the same mutation that was found in the tumor specimen was also found in, the, in one of his genes that he was born with, the MSH2 gene, which is consistent with Lynch syndrome. So this uh, ultimately impacts his treatment course, his risk for other types of cancer and screening for him. But um, what I really wanted to focus on today is the importance of doing what's called cascade testing, where we're testing for family members, um, including at-risk children. So this is the original um, patient. And now we're concerned about his um, daughter and son having this mutation. And so I met with the daughter. And when we meet with um, the children of patients who have a mutation, it's also important to get the other side of the family tree, her mother's, because sometimes there might be other cancers on that side that we're concerned about. Um, and you might be wondering, well, what about testing for the son? You know, he's at risk too. And Lynch syndrome also exhibits autosomal dominant inheritance pattern. Well, we know that she's at a 50% chance of inheriting the mutation identified in her father, but so is her brother independent of um, her genetic test results. There are age considerations that are important. And the sort of rule of thumb is that we don't test any individual unless it would change their current management. Lynch syndrome's a condition that really we don't really start screening for until adulthood, and it can be um, sort of damaging from an, a, a psychosocial perspective to test someone who's young and has other considerations in their life when it, it wouldn't directly impact their current management. So um, best to wait till uh, he's older to offer this genetic testing for this particular condition. So um, we did offer testing to the daughter, and you know, unfortunately, she did test positive um, for the mutation that was found in her father. I think, you know, it's it's not really the news that we're hoping for, but at the same time, it's also empowering to know about this because we have an explanation for the family history and we can be proactive about screening and preventing the associated cancers. Um, the reports will sometimes have ranges of risk for certain types of cancer. And as you can see, for this particular mutation, there's a significantly elevated risk for colorectal cancer, endometrial, which is uterine cancer, stomach cancer and ovarian cancer, as well as others. Um, and I think what's helpful when we meet with patients is to look at these age-related risks. So even for hereditary cancer syndromes like Lynch syndrome, we tend to see an earlier age of diagnosis than we would in the general population, but um, screening might not begin until 20 to 25. And that's because that's when the risk really starts separating from the population curve um, and increasing significantly. And oftentimes, you know, if we're doing these colonoscopies, we can, uh, the, the doctors who are performing, performing them can identify precancerous polyps and take them out. And um, it's highly effective at um, screening for and preventing, in some cases, colon cancer. Um, 
I, I will briefly discuss this, but you know, we also make sure that we screen for upper gastrointestinal cancers. And so, um, you know, it's, it's good to know about this so that we can do our best to make sure that patients are being managed appropriately. For women, um, there are considerations for gynecologic cancers such as endometrial, as mentioned, as well as ovarian. Um, and we have an excellent clinic here at USC that manages our um, female mutation carriers and um, who in this case can consider having their um, uterus removed or ovaries removed to prevent these cancers from occurring. Although it's sort of an individualized um, decision that takes a lot of um, uh, de deliberations and there's a lot of factors that go into making that decision such as childbearing and, and so forth. Um, so I won't dwell on that too much. Um, I do want to make sure I'm leaving time here. And uh, I'll just discuss another patient example of how informative testing can, can be really valuable to family members. Um, another hereditary cancer syndrome that we assess for and that we see in, even um, in the AYA population is something that's called familial adenoma, adenomatous polyposis or FAP. These individuals um, can actually develop hundreds to thousands of colonic polyps, and those can eventually turn into cancer. And, um, Colon colorectal cancer for these individuals with classic or full, um, like classic FAP uh, is inevitable in some cases um, without proper management or um, having one's colon removed. Um, and it's important to know that a lot of these syndromes have other cancer risks and features. So for FAP, we, we think about stomach or duodenal polyps, or sometimes individuals with this condition can have supernumerary teeth or certain other types of cancers. Um, so we do assess for this condition. And uh, I'll show another patient case briefly to, to show why it's important to test within the AYA population if we know that there's a familial variant. Um, so this um, woman unfortunately presented with rectal pain and had a colonoscopy four months, essentially after her symptoms began. And um, when they did the colonoscopy, they found two, two masses as well as multiple polyps um, consistent with, um, and, and two of those masses were consistent with cancer. Um, and a subsequent CT scan so showed that she actually had um, disease in her liver as well. And what you can see here is that there is some remarkable family history. We see that her father was diagnosed with col colorectal cancer and that his mother was diagnosed with colorectal cancer and sort of showing autosomal dominant, dominant inheritance pattern and nothing overly concerning on um, the maternal lineage. Some young, a young melanoma um, and a kidney cancer. Um, so, <clears throat> we, when, when they do um, tumor testing, they screen for Lynch syndrome and um, there wasn't any indication that her Lynch syndrome genes were not working, but we did identify a um, variant in APC, which is that gene that causes familial adenomatous polyposis, so FAP. And all her colon polyps and the fact that she has two colon primaries really makes us think that this could be a real mutation. And we did the blood test and confirmed that it that she was born with a um, mutation in this gene that caused her familial adenomatous polyposis, or in her case, um, she was diagnosed at a somewhat later age, so it could be attenuated. The reason I'm presenting this case is um, she has a 16-year-old son who is at risk for inheriting that, and you know I think she went on her whole life not really knowing about um, a lot of the oh, sorry a lot of the family history and um, wants to be proactive and, and um, get ahead of this. And so in a way, it's, it's a good thing that we've actually identified what's caused the cancer in the family so that we can um, get ahead of screening and testing for other family members. And so I met with her 16-year-old son. And for this condition, as opposed to Lynch syndrome, um, some of the cancer screenings are recommended at a very young age. And so um, they're for some of those other cancer risks, but also getting colonoscopies at in someone's you know, early teen years is, is recommended for people who have this condition. And so he meets criteria for testing because even though he's not an adult yet, screening would be recommended if he tested positive. And fortunately, he tested negative. And I think that's, to me, these are really powerful and important cases because we've identified the thing that's causing the cancers in the family. And he's what's considered a true negative, meaning that he's essentially at population level risk and doesn't need to undergo enhanced screening based on the family history. And so, um, you know, these patients are really elated when they learn that they are not a mutation carrier, especially if there's a known familial variant. So these sort, sorts of cases are, um, they sort of stick with you. And, and um, 
I think it sort of shows the importance of doing genetic testing and family member testing as well. Um, so I'll briefly just explain a little bit about what it takes to see us for genetic um, assessment. And usually it's a, it's a two visit structure. We see patients pretest where we collect the personal and family history and um, understand some of their concerns and then educate them on um, the genetics and risks and benefits of testing as well as the types of results that we might get. And then if they provide informed consent, order the testing. And then there's also post-testing visit um, typically. And sometimes this is as easy as calling someone and telling them that they have negative results, but also explaining what those negative results mean and screening that's recommended in the context of their family history. Um, if the results are positive, then we provide um, uh, support, further counseling and help them cope with the diagnosis, but also um, do a risk assessment and, and um, recommend testing for family members as appropriate. So that's a good segue into discussing genetic testing for the entire family. Um, and it's an individual choice, but we share our genetic information with our family members. It's important that we ask questions and uh, ascertain what our family history might be. Um, if there's a female cancer in the family, you know, is it ovarian cancer? Is it uterine cancer or cervical? These each have different cancer syndromes that are in the differential diagnosis or uh, sort of risks for being hereditary. Um, gastrointestinal cancers, was it colon, pancreatic, et cetera. And so when we meet with some individuals, they might provide a limited family history, but, and, and this is the case for, this is an example where there's a 39 year old male who presented because of his diagnosis of sarcoma and skin cancer and his sister with lymphoma. And, you know, we ask him about his family history and he knows his father and his mother's cancer history and, and maybe even his maternal grandmother's but if he just asked his parents and they might be able to provide more information and we get a whole um, a whole family tree here and that can help us to um, determine what cancer syndromes that we're most concerned about and who might be at risk for also having um, a familial a mutation if it's identified. We uh, routinely are sort of casting wider and wider nets uh, of genes that cause hereditary cancer. Julie, discuss BRCA1, BRCA2, I discuss Lynch syndrome and FAP, but there's so many others um, that we, we test for and, and counsel for. And so it's becoming more important to do panel testing. Um, I'll, I guess I'll skip this slide um, and just talk about uh, the fact that, you know, insurance coverage for genetic testing is very good. Um, most insurance companies will cover the cost of testing uh, if patients meet criteria, uh, though the insurance companies do have specific criteria that need to be met in certain cases. Um, and sometimes there might be a copay, but the nice thing is that we know going into the session that most labs, if not all the ones that we order through, offer a self-pay price of $250 if insurance doesn't cover their testing. And um, so it's good to know that the price for this sort of text testing maxes out at $250. And um, actually what's nice is that um, our department's been granted a, um, I thought, a donation to help with covering the cost of testing for people who meet criteria who aren't covered for testing through their insurance. And that's been a really great resource for our patients. And so um, it, it's really wonderful that we have that. Some individuals are and patients are concerned about laws um, and um, preventing from discrim discrimination or genetic discrimination. There are laws in place that defend us from health insurance companies or employers uh, discriminating based on genetic information. There are some limitations to this law. Uh, they don't extend to life disability or long-term. Um, and so that can be a, a conversation that's had with the genetic counselor. Now, uh, just for the conclusion, so um, as mentioned, you know, five to 10% of cancer is hereditary. It depends on the type. Um, and genetic test results can influence cancer treatment decisions, as we mentioned. And uh, ultimately this provides valuable information for cancer prevention and uh, screening and early detection and also uh, testing for family members. And so if you do decide to see a genetics provider, it's important to know about your family history and that can be very valuable. We have an excellent team of genetic counselors here at USC. Um, Julie, who's the director of our genetic counseling department, uh, me, Emmeline and Becca, and then uh, we, we get referrals from many different providers, but our primary physician is Dr. Darcy Spicer. And so um, I can leave this slide up or we can provide these contact details to anyone who's interested, but we are um, really happy to see patients who um, wanna see us for assessing for hereditary cancer and, and consideration of genetic testing.
So thank you all for your time. Uh, I think we can hopefully have some time to answer questions if there are any.